Well, I've gone long enough on this channel without talking about it. The show, the franchise, the legend, Spongebob Squarepants. I feel pretty secure thinking that my audience probably knows who this is. I mean, even if you've never seen one of the well over 200 episodes or one of the two movies or the Tony winning Broadway show, you've probably seen merchandise or memes or the species of fungus named after the character. Being so popular, a lot has already been done on the subject. People have discussed its shifting quality, its coding, its relatability, and its adaptability. What new insights could I add to those conversations? Probably not much. But where I could? In the conversation about Spongebob's thematic similarities to ancient Greek poetry. The Spongebob Squarepants movie is pretty funny. It's got plenty of good jokes, good voice acting, and manages to be a fun expansion within a well-established universe. It's got its problems, absolutely. I'm not a fan of every creative choice. But most fans would seem to agree that, as far as Spongebob goes, the movie is a pretty good representation. And, interestingly, it's also a very good adaptation of Homer's epic Odessia, known in English as The Odyssey. The Odyssey should honestly require no introduction either. It's one of the most famous stories of all time, worldwide. If you haven't read it, or one of the many works based off of it, or seen one of its adaptations, you've probably at least watched or read things with references to it. The tale of a man facing hardship after tragedy to finally make his way back to his beloved wife has resonated with millennia, and has been transposed to take place in early 20th century Ireland, the postbellum South, Great Depression Mississippi, modern-day Yemen, 31st century Japanese space, and whatever time period Jupiter Ascending takes place in. But it was also adapted to take place under the sea. Seriously. Sure, Spongebob doesn't adapt everything from the Odyssey. There's no Trojan War equivalent, and thankfully we don't have any equivalent of the times that Odysseus is raped throughout the story. But almost every island that Odysseus visits is represented in the Spongebob movie. The Krusty Krab is where the majority of the previous work's episodes centered, just like Troy was the center of the Iliad. The Goofy Goober, where time passes quicker than Spongebob expects it to, is reminiscent of the island of the Lotus Eaters. Shell City is the lair of the gift-making hostile Cyclops, just like Polyphemus' isle. Aeolia and Aeaea may not have a physical representation, but both of the gifts Odysseus receives from the gods are mirrored in Mindy's presence, a bag of wind and a weed that provides bravery and clarity. The Thug Tug is filled with violent, inhospitable, toxically masculine giants, just like Telepolis was filled with the Lastragonians. And though it's not the land of the dead, the trench is literally the underworld. The sirens lure sailors to their deaths with the allure of sweet music, while the frogfish lures fish to their deaths with the allure of sweet ice cream. Every island except Ogygia, Ismaros, and the island of Helios has a representative in this movie. And before anybody says I forgot Sharia, I was just saving the best for last. The Phaeacians are described as beautiful, helpful, nautical, and powerful. Could there be a more obvious analog than David Hasselhoff? And the story adds up too. Our protagonist has to go on a major quest to reunite with his endangered beloved, and save them from unwanted guests. One loyal family member alone tries to maintain honor in the hero's home, during their absence. The hero is antagonized by the god of the ocean, but assisted by the daughter of the chief of the gods. Regular setbacks and losses of vehicles delay the process, but ultimately the family is reunited, and the antagonists are either dissuaded, defeated, or punished. Yet, all of that superficial stuff exists in multiple iterations of the story. Where the Spongebob Squarepants movie stands out is in its dedication to the theme that is present in the Odyssey. Specifically, Xenia, as it's called in Greek, translated roughly to guest friendship, and it's arguably the most consistent theme of the original epic. It's good to be hospitable, but it's bad to either abuse that hospitality or refuse it to your guests. Odysseus either has to manipulate or deceive those that refuse him hospitality, proving that his intelligence and ruthlessness are great, or, when he is treated kindly by his hosts, be appreciative and respectful. When he or his crew abuse the hospitality of others, they are punished, and the suitors at Ithaca are punished for their incivility as well. And the Spongebob Squarepants movie really gets this theme right. Spongebob endangers his friend by abusing hospitality provided to him at Goofy Goobers, sending him on this quest. Floyd, Lloyd, and the patrons of the Thug Tug are inhospitable to Spongebob Patrick and Dennis, being punished by the latter. On top of his act of stealing and attempted murder, Plankton abuses his guests at the Chum Bucket, but is ultimately defeated. And the same thing happens with Frogfish and the Cyclops. The type of hospitality advocated for in the Odyssey is largely antiquated. 
We don't live in a world where you can let anybody that comes to your door into your home, especially if you're a woman. However, hospitality itself is not dead. When people give you gifts, you should appreciate them. When people need help, you should offer it. And though these concepts are far from complex, SpongeBob isn't really trying to be complex. No amount of literary references, or celebrity cameos, or some other third thing can stop SpongeBob from being what it truly is. For kids. And that's just fine. SpongeBob isn't just mindless entertainment, though. It also encourages things like optimism, diligence, and of course, hospitality. So even though it's not necessarily the most refined form of entertainment for children, it has a lot going for it.